Hey there, this is Jennifer Simonetti Bryan, Master of Wine here at the Weekly Tasting, and this week we are in Italy, in the region of Piemonte. Piemonte literally translates to foot of the mountains in Italian, and it is indeed at the foot of the Alps. So yes, it's at the foot of the mountains, um, the Alps, and there's a lot of hills, so it's a very hilly region, and if you ever take a drive there, make sure you sit in the front seat, because if you're in the back seat, you're gonna get sick. I know, I did it. Um, so, because you've got a lot of winding roads and everything, but you'll also notice that um, there's a lot of fog in the area in the mornings, just like you see in Sonoma, and it makes these great pocket microclimates for different grape varieties that some do better in more warmth, others do better with cool grape varieties, so it's really interesting to see. Now, have you ever had the Italian dessert tiramisu? You've probably heard of it if you've ever gone to an Italian restaurant and seen it on a menu. Uh, tiramisu is uh, from Piemonte, and uh, stick with me, I've got a point here. Tiramisu is made with these little cookies, um, or light, long cookies that translates to ladyfingers. Um, and it's in Italian, it's Savoyardi. Savoyardi is ladyfingers. And why, why that's important and why that means something is in Piemonte, it used to be part of an old ancient kingdom called the Savoy or Savoy Kingdom, which used to stretch from the region of Piemonte all the way up to Burgundy. And what that means, and it actually translates even today, um, there's a lot of commonalities between Burgundy and this region and Piemonte, and it comes out in the viticulture. First of all, they share a lot of different agricultural aspects over the centuries, and so their viticulture is fairly similar. We also see a lot of finesse and, and um, a lot of high quality in their cuisine. For example, they use a lot of truffles in Piemonte, and Piemonte is known for its white truffles. It's fantastic. Um, lastly, even the dialect sounds more French in Piemonte than the common Italian dialect. So if you ever go there and you hear them speaking Italian, it actually sounds more French than Italian. So there's a huge connection between Burgundy and Piemonte. And the wines themselves also have a finesse and an elegance to them so that it gives you an insight as to why. So let's go and taste through them. The first wine we have in this pack is a Dolcetto from the region of Dogliani. Dolcetto is the name of the grape, and it, it translates to little sweet one in Italian. It's not a sweet wine. It's dry, 100% dry wine, but the grape itself translates to little sweet one. And it's not as planted as much as, let's say, Barbera, but this has a unique characteristic to it. And when I was studying wine, I always heard this term damson fruit. Well, what does damson fruit mean? Well, it means, and what, what I'm going to interpret for you, it means um, plum. So a damson plum, it's, it's got this plumminess, this black, purple, blue fruit kind of um, fruit, which if you like Merlot or you like Malbec, you're going to enjoy this wine. Because if you like that, similar kind of fruit, you're going to like it in Dolcetto. And on the palate, it's medium body and moderate to moderately high acid just because it comes from the, the region of Dogliani. Dogliani is uh, a little higher in its elevation than, let's say, uh, the region of Alba and other areas where Dolcetto is grown. And why we care about elevation is the higher up you go, the cooler it gets, and also the smaller um, pulp to skin ratio is. So there's more skin to the actual pulp, which makes it a much more dense and uh, richer kind of style of wine. But on the palate, it has a higher level of acidity too because of the cooler temperatures. So this, in comparison to let's say a Dolcetto d'Alba, is gonna be higher in acidity, perhaps a touch lighter in body, but there's a there's also a flintiness to the aromatics of this wine. And this one sees some new oak. A lot of times when you see Dolcetto, it, you don't see oak at all and you just see pure fruit. But here you do see some French oak and um, it adds a vanilla spice and char characteristic to the wine. And it actually rounds out some of those tannins. And it's got 
fairly low tannin, so it's a very easy drinking wine. Now in the region of Piemonte, they're also known for um, cattle breeding, and so the quality of beef there is extremely high. They have so something called double muscling in their cattle, and it's got very low fat. So it's no wonder that they have their own version, just like the French do, of beef tartare. And you can also have, um, this wine would go incredibly well with that, but if you want to skip that, and um, you could probably also go with a carpaccio, a very thinly sliced beef, um, and it's absolutely delicious. And anytime you have protein, like beef, um, with a red wine, it's gonna reduce the impression of bitterness. And that's why they said red wine and red meat. But it's really the protein that has a chemical reaction with the tannins in the wine and reduces that impression of bitterness. So it works with beef and it also works with cheese. So you're gonna enjoy that. The second wine we have in the pack is a Barbera d'Alba Superiore. And as the name kind of implies, Superiore is superior in Italian. And if you see that at the end of um, a wine from this region, it indicates a level of quality. So Superiore is a bit higher in quality than regular Alba. So this is a Barbera d'Alba Superiore. So that's what that means. And it, it can, have a little bit higher level of alcohol and it may require some lower yields, but in general they say that this is a better quality wine, so you know, superiore at the end. Barbera itself, if you're comparing it to the Dolcetto, has more of a red fruit characteristic as opposed to the damson or black fruit or black plum fruit that you get from Dolcetto. Barbera is known for it's high acidity, and if you like Pinot Noir, you're probably gonna really like Barbera, and particularly Barbera d'Alba. It has, um, again, some red cherry fruit, high level of acidity, low level of tannin, so low level of bitterness. It makes this also a very easy drinking, elegant wine. Like Dolcetto, Traditionally speaking, it was made with no impression of oak whatsoever. So they either used old oak or in modern times you use stainless steel for a traditional style. However, this is a little bit more modern or I should say it's probably halfway between modern and, and traditional because it's got 20% new French oak on it which gives it that vanilla kind of spiciness and so it's like vanilla with cherries which, you know, I like. and. Also, uh, it's been matured in Slavonian oak as well. It's been matured in Slavonian oak. So what does that mean? Slavonian oak, in comparison to French oak, Sl Slavonian is a bit softer and more delicate in the flavor and character it imparts into the wine. The Fr French oak is a lot more intense vanilla spice, and if American oak, which you don't really see in Italy, but American oak lends like a coconut kind of flavor, and some people say dill. I, don't, I never get dill, but um, some of you might. Um, but those are the differences in oak. Some people use Hungarian oak, some people use Portuguese oak, like they use in Portugal, but this sees new French oak and Slavonian oak. So the intensity of that spice is, is not as intense, but you got a little touch of Frenchness there, which is wonderful. In terms of food and wine pairing, um, Barbera d'Alba, is actually, gives me a memory of one of the best food and wine pairings I've ever had in my entire life. So that says a lot. It was actually in Piemonte when I had it and it was uh, these little raviolis called agnolotti. Agnolotti is these little semi-circle, lack of a better term, semi-circle raviolis uh, that is made in the area where they're known from, and they're filled with cheese, and it had a butter, sage, and white truffle sauce. Oh my God, was this amazing. And I had it with a Barbera d'Alba. Now you may know Barbera d'Asti, which is from the region of Asti. This is Barbera d'Alba, region of Alba. And when I was studying, I always tried to remember it like this. Asti is the skinny sister to Alba, which is the more voluptuous, party-going sister, because um, Barbera d'Alba, the Barberas that come from this region, are a little bit fuller in body, so they're a bit weightier on the palate. They're less acidic, 
a um, little rounder on the palate, and it's got a little bit of higher level of alcohol. So that's why I say it's the, the fuller, vo more voluptuous uh, party going sister. Uh, so hopefully you'll taste that and enjoy that wine. The third and final wine we have in this pack is a Barbaresco Riserva. Now the word Riserva has a meaning, just like Superiore has a meaning, but it is kind of nebulous. In um, Riserva, as you've probably guessed, means reserve, uh, but it has different meanings in different regions, and it generally means it's been aged for over a year, but it's not really tied down to any specific amount of time, or I should say too that some regions have one specified time and other regions have different specified times. So for example, Barolo can age up to 62 months, and that's a combination between barrel aging and bottle aging. So when you see the word Reserva, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a higher quality wine, not necessarily, generally is, but not necessarily, but it does mean that it's been aged longer, particularly in a producer's portfolio. Now, this wine, the Barbaresco Reserva that we have here, um, it is made with Nebbiolo. Nebbiolo is the name of the grape, and it, the grape variety name comes from the word Nebbia, or fog in French, and uh, French <laughs> in Italian. Um, get that connection, the French connection going on there. Um, it, it means uh, fog, and what it refers to is the fog that comes rolling in into the morning and in the evening in this region. Remember we were talking about in the beginning all those hills? Well, that's what creates these little micro climates, little pockets all around, just like you see in Sonoma. But that's where you get some of these influences from. And, and Nebbiolo is a wine of extremes. If if uh, all grape varieties had an extreme sports contest, Nebbiolo would win because it's extremely high in acid, it's high in alcohol, it is high in tannin. But the only thing you don't see that it's really high in is color. Yeah, that might blow your you know brains out there a little bit because the color of Nebbiolo is a pale ruby. And a lot of times, too, because the intensity of the tannin is so high, it's aged for a long period of time, so it kind of takes the rough edges off of that bitterness, you know, of where the tannin. And when you age a wine, you get a lot more earthiness and more spice that comes through. Not more fruit. Actually, the fruit drops back a little bit, but you have more things that come through. In this wine, this is 2011, I get a lot of tea leaf and rose petal, which is also high, very known for uh, Nebbiolo, so tea leaf and rose petal, and some dried strawberry. So that's really a delicious combination, but that spiciness you're gonna get, especially in comparison to the Barbera and the Dolcetto. But Nebbiolo is known for more red berries, so that strawberry kind of, of note. In terms of food and wine pairing, there's another connection to uh, France here. In Burgundy, they have beef bourguignon, and they have coco vin, which is you know beef braised in red Burgundy. Also, coco vin is also you know chicken braised in red wine. And here in this region, they have veal that's braised in Nebbiolo. So that is a local dish, and is, as they say, if it grows together, it goes together. So that is this pack. I hope you've enjoyed it. I really enjoyed putting this pack together for you, and I hope it really delivers on, on flavor and quality for you like it does for me. And until next time, cheers.